Good morning from our World Headquarters in New York. I'm Manis Cranny. And I'm Danny Berger. Welcome to Bloomberg Brief. Let's set your agenda. The 10-year yield eyes 4.5%. Markets settled on two rate cuts this year, though the former Fed official James Bullard eyes three. Israel signals fresh optimism on ceasefire talks in Gaza as Hamas claims there's been no progress. And commodity traders had another blockbuster year, raking in billions in 2023. She survived the eclipse. <laughs> I mean, my eyes hurt a little bit. I did use the glasses, but you know, you're still kind of looking at the sun. Good to see she took the medical notes. <laughs> Let's talk about these bond markets. Will we survive? What's going to happen when we trade? If we trade 4.5%, because there is almost a, a breathless sense in this market that we're one one moment away from breaking the 4.5 percent could it be that the cpi data tomorrow is the one that does us in now the new york fed inflation expectations hold at three percent for the third month in a row sticky and enduring inflation will be the challenge for the fed bullard talks about three rate cuts and the dramatic success of policy dollar yen you're on tender hooks if you're not waiting for cpi you see you want to see what level and scale of intervention there may be in the yen it's at a 34 year low. There's no hard line in the sand from the Bank of Japan, but the finance minister this morning, Suzuki, says uh, developments with a sense of urgency. He's watching those who waited at the Bank of Japan, says, desirable for FX to move in a stable manner. Well, it's been drifting around this level. What will they do if we break 152? Oil is back on the bid again, uh, up a half of 1%. We gave some back yesterday. Goldman Sachs, you got it. The note is in the inbox. $100 oil. If there is a significant interruption upstream, downstream, or, or indeed midstream, that could take us to $100 oil. Danny, good morning. Good morning, Manis. Well, in the meantime, in equity land over here, there's little to really drive any moves in either direction. We're unchanged for both the S&P and the NASDAQ 100. The good news about that, though, is the volatility is subsiding that we saw from that momentary spike last week. It does show that more puts are being had in this market. But it's interesting, Chris Harvey over at Wells Fargo yesterday upgrades to a fresh bullish target, 5,535, which is kind of such a specific number that it's ridiculous that I love it. But he says the way people are thinking about valuations is now different considering AI. You can't use the traditional metrics. European stocks down two tenths of 1%. The only thing really doing better is energy and materials. We had BP earnings, yet again, a strong... I should say trading, strong trading figures from BP. But the interesting thing here, man, is, is we're not seeing cracks as yields go to year-to-date highs. As we try to judge what cuts are happening, how many, two, three, what have you. And on that note, as you said, Manus, we did hear from the former St. Louis Fed President James Bullard. He was speaking at the HSBC Global Summit in Hong Kong to discuss his thoughts on how many rate cuts he sees this year. You should probably take uh, the committee and the chair at face value. I think their best guess right now is still three cuts this year. And, of course, uh, the data can go one way or another, but that's the base case. And Bullard there really is just echoing daily, Master. We've heard many Fed officials say it's three, but it's so fascinating to see that we're now fighting the Fed again but on the opposite side of a market that's just pricing in two cuts. Yeah, and I mean, he does go on to talk about the dramatic success of the Fed's policy. Of course, the argument there would be is that you've had dramatic turnaround in the supply side rather than the residual impact of 500 basis points of hikes. I'm sorry, but if you're a former Fed official, of course you're going to say it was successful. Absolutely. you got to talk Him to sheet. your own book. <laughs> All right, let's widen out the conversation. Joining us now is Katrina Dudley, investment strategist at Franklin Templeton Investments. Katrina, has the market gone too far for hearing from Bullard saying it's going to be three cuts, believe the Fed when they say that, and now we've moved to two? Okay, so number one, there is a difference of opinion. You look at like a Neil Kaskari yeah. who says zero rate cuts are going to come in this year. Um, and if you, I look at the beginning of the year, which isn't that far, you know, that many months ago, we were looking at three, four, even five cuts. So I think that the market is still uncertain. What does that say to me, though? It says that the, we have flexibility, and that's such a great thing. Um, look at Jamie Dimon's letter, which came out. He's looking at what? The market's saying 70%. 80% chance of a soft landing. Well, what if we're wrong? Mm. We have tools here. We have the ability to cut rates and stimulate the economy if we see those signs of weakness. So it's flexibility, and I think that that's really what's driving valuations here. I was drawn to a line from Goldsby yesterday. He talks about, I love this, there's a normal boom time. Where do you want to be most exposed 
beyond tech, we will get to tech, I promise you. <laughs> you can have it in there as half an answer. But where do you want to be exposed most now in a normal boom time? And how long do you think it will endure? Do you think we're in a new cycle of a, a normal boom time? OK, so let's separate two markets because the US has, you know, is, is in a kind of upswing and, and probably later in the cycle because it didn't have any type of downturn. But if you look outside of the US, we have so many markets mm -hmm. which went either into recession or were so close going going into recession and those markets have definitely boomed um, or come out of that yeah. recession but they're not in that kind of boom period so we definitely for once in, in a long time have differing cycles and different places where we are um, in terms of the market though in the US what is driving this kind of continued acceleration and it's AI hmm. um, and a lot of people are trying to predict the end of AI I would say that AI is a theme today but AI has been in our life for so many years it's just the use cases are becoming more right. transparent. Well, it's open AI. All of a sudden, we're all exposed to how powerful AI is, so we've woken up to it. What do you make of Chris Harvey's argument over at Wells Fargo saying that the normal valuation metrics don't apply for investors anymore because they're looking at the potential of AI, you can't say, oh, these are expensive. It doesn't work that way anymore. <laughs> I think we said that back in the internet yeah. bubble that, yep, that, exactly. that the valuation <laughs> doesn't apply. Valuation matters. Okay, I, that that is the baseline assumption because the returns that you make are a function of what you pay for a stock today and what you think it is worth in the future. And both of those are valuation centric measures. So I do think that valuations definitely play a role. Where could we be, you know, wrong is that AI is going to accelerate the growth and it's going to yeah. accelerate the pace at which companies get to those forward earnings number because they'll get cost efficiency. So if I look at where I think we could be wrong in our models, it's actually we could be wrong in terms of how much this generates margin-wise and cost savings-wise. Do you think maybe that's why some people question how stretched some of the valuations are in the MAG7 at the top end and, and that that's going to become a little bit harder to justify? We did a piece yesterday in terms of look at the global markets for the next AI iteration, not the NVIDIA, not the Meta, not those stretch valuations in the U.S. Does it just become harder to defend adding at those levels in the U.S. names? I think most of these tech names have got a lot of the AI opportunity priced in. I think you're right. right. That said, even at these valuations, as long as they grow earnings, those stocks, if they just maintain the valuation, can continue to perform at the rate of earnings growth. And they actually could have a little bit of valuation weakness and still perform because they are yeah. growing so strongly. But where in the market are we surprised? I'm just surprised at how many use cases there mm. are for AI. And I think you're going to start to see AI bleed into other parts of the economy. You're talking at bleeding into financial services, and so it could provide a lift there. It's bleeding into the industrial market and making it, you know, you're driving returns there. Right. So I think that that's the opportunity. But I mean, at the same time, you see things like, I don't know, my, my toothbrush, for example, doesn't need AI. It does feel like there are some circumstances where companies, I mean, it's not as successful as it was in quarters past, but just talking about AI just to get it out there, maybe so the algos see that they're talking about AI and bid up the price. How do you distinguish what companies are promising too much. Okay, so let's take your toothbrush example. <laughs> um, it didn't take me that long to train my children on how to brush their teeth. It used to take six months mm. to train a robot on how to brush your teeth because of the amount of sensitivity you need to squeeze the toothbrush. Mm. That time has now compressed significantly. And I laughingly use toothbrushing as an example, <laughs> but that's where you've had so many of the benefits in the compression of the time it takes. And so that's where I see some of the real benefits is that it's just going to come into our lives so much quicker than we anticipated. So as you talk to the teams then about how you broaden the search for AI, just give us, give us an example of, of, of what that is on a sort of daily, monthly basis in terms of how you expand the search? I think it, it, it involves talking to companies and understanding the use case and also understanding the culture at the company and the willingness of the, the, the their organization to embrace AI. Because you, know, Jamie Dimon at JP Morgan to, can identify 400 use cases for AI, but he's got to have 400 divisions that are willing to use that right. technology. You can get, you, know, you kind of, you can 
can give them that technology, but if they're not using it to enhance their mm -hmm. productivity, you're never going to see the benefits and all we're going to see is the cost and you're not going to get the follow on earnings growth. Now, now recently the rally Katrina though, it has been more than tech. It has yes. been more than AI. Yes. We've seen a broadening out. Energy hits a new record. Industrials, financials, all at all time highs. Mm -hmm. Can that broadening out last? And could we even see a leadership shift? It sounds like not. But potentially those are the companies who are incorporating AI that aren't those classic tech plays. Yeah, I think that, look, what we're looking at in this market and what we're very aware of is what are the risks? Because we're talking about Goldilocks here. I mean, it's great, isn't it? GDP growth is strong. Inflation is under control. The Fed is very you know, steady as, she, as he or she goes. Um, so the Goldilocks is the norm and it's what's priced in. And if you're looking at a landing, it's a very nice, gentle, soft landing. So what are we talking about with our teams? the risks. And I think you need to be, as an investor, very aware of those risks. One of the risks that we do see coming into the play as we get closer and closer to November in the mm -hmm. US is the election cycle. Yep. That cycle is also playing out in other parts of the world. We're not the only people going to the polls this year. 41% um, of the global population will be joining us. Um, and so as you look at an election, you need to be aware that those th the election is a binary outcome because one or the other party wins. And so that creates some uncertainty. So we're looking at the sectors that whether or not they're pricing in that. So mm. that is the other side of all this bullishness is that we need to be aware of those risks. And you have defense down there squarely as being the one area that wins regardless yes. of, of, who, of, of who comes through. Uh, thank you so much for being with us uh, this morning. That is Katrina Dudley of Franklin Templeton Investment setting the agenda. Uh, other stories trending on your Bloomberg terminal this Tuesday morning. UBS is in discussions to attain full ownership off its China platform. Sources say it's proposing to buy the remaining 33% stake in UBS securities from the Beijing government fund. Now, in return, it would sell part or all of its position in Credit Suisse's securities unit to the fund. Blackstone is said to be nearing a deal to take cosmetics company Loxitan private. Sources say the private equity firm may team up with the cosmetic giant's billionaire owner for the buyout. Sunday's broadcast of the NCAA Women's College Basketball Championship drew a record TV audience. The game between the victorious South Carolina Gamecocks and Iowa Hawkeyes drew 18.7 million viewers. That was on ABC and ESPN. Numbers made the fin final the most watched women's college basketball ever. Go Caitlin Clark. All right, Senate Republican leader Mitch McConnell supports a bipartisan effort to pass the bill forcing TikTok's parent company to sell the video sharing app. He says that requiring ByteDance to divest from TikTok lands squarely within established constitutional precedent and says this matter deserves Congress's urgent attention. All right, coming up on the program with Manus and me, fresh optimism coming from the Middle East on ceasefire talks. We're going to have that for you next here on Bloomberg Brief. This is Bloomberg Brief. I'm Manish Granny alongside Danny Berger here in New York. Some fresh optimism on the ceasefire talks coming from Israeli officials. The foreign minister is saying, quote, we've reached a critical point. If matters work out, a large number of hostages will return home then in stages. Everyone, I am more optimistic than I was. This is coming, as Hamas said, there has been no progress in the talks. Let's bring in our Israel bureau chief, Ethan Bronner, for more. Ethan, um, which side do we come down on? I mean, where do things stand in terms of this ceasefire? Is it real? Is it perceived? Is it a winning war of words from the Israeli side? Uh, Hamas sound pretty emphatic that there's been no progress. Yes, well, you've summed it up well. I mean, I don't think we can really know. It's clear that their public postures are quite hard line. Uh, the Israeli prime minister is also issued a statement last night saying no matter what, we're going to invade Rafah eventually. Uh, and the uh, Hamas uh, officials have said there is the Israelis have been completely inflexible in what they've offered. So both sides have taken a public posture saying it's the other side's fault. Inside the room in Cairo, there seems to be some flexibility. The idea is that the Americans are pushing very hard for a deal that the Israelis say they can live with. And now they're waiting to see what Hamas says. It'll be a day or two. From the political side, things in the U.S., so much 
is riding on Biden being able to usher this in, considering we're entering or we are in the election year. And on the Israeli side, Netanyahu, of course, has had a lot of criticism. So if a deal is achieved, if there is a ceasefire, what does that mean for the two various politicians? Look, I think you're right that for President Biden, it's a very important uh, accomplishment, although a lot of the anger at Biden comes from people who are not necessarily eager to see a ceasefire. They're really uh, quite, they have fairly strong views on the illegitimacy of Israel. This is uh, Arab Americans and younger uh, Democrats uh, in places like Michigan. So it's hard to know that it would necessarily help Biden. In terms of Israel, it's a very complex picture because his uh, his the public and and his um, partners to the center and slightly to the left of him are very eager for a deal, but his partners to the right on whom he relies to stay in power uh, are not enthusiastic about a deal. They worry that a deal will mean that there will not be an invasion of Rafah, that Hamas will not be eliminated uh, militarily as they wish to happen. So it's a very complex picture, and I don't know what's going to happen uh, to Prime Minister Netanyahu if a deal uh, emerges. Well, Prime Minister Netanyahu said last night that there is an actual date for an invasion into Rafa. And then you've got the world leaders, obviously, uh, all various factions over the past number of days, urging Israel not to go into Rafa. So where is that headed? That's right. Well, we don't know. I mean, I think that, uh, look, part, part of the uh, importance of the Netanyahu statement is to say to his own coalition partners, don't worry, don't leave me yet, and to say to Hamas, if you don't go forward with the deal, we're coming to get you. Now, does that mean he will actually go in? I don't think we know. The Israelis pulled out their combat troops from Khan Yunus, the city in the south of Gaza, over Sunday night, Monday. Uh, and some people view that as a signal that they're uh, trying to uh, tip their hat to, to Hamas for a deal. Others say, no, they're just pulling their troops out in order to rest them to go into Rafah afterwards. And I, I think it's quite possible that they themselves are not sure what's going to happen. All right. Ethan, thank you very much for that update. Uh, uh, ever a fast-moving and complex picture. That is Bloomberg's Ethan Bronner joining us from Tel Aviv. Manis. Yeah, um, Danny, let's just check in on some of these commodities because it's certainly worth taking a note. Um, oil, as I said at the start of the show, we were the first drop in, in five sessions yesterday, but we're reasserting ourselves uh, to the upside on the oil market. But iron ore, keep an eye on that, Danny, because uh, there's a real turnaround there. I mean, it's been battered and bruised, down 9%, 10-month low, mm. but it is turning around ever so slightly this morning. So a nice bounce in the iron ore market. Yeah, and as you point out to me, the biggest two-day jump since 2021. Macquarie says that demand is returning to the seasonal norms. Monetary policy isn't conducted for the purposes of controlling exchange rates. Exchange rates may have an impact that can't be ignored on economic and price trends. In such a situation, there's a possibility of considering a monetary policy response. This is a general statement. That was the governor of the Bank of Japan speaking a little bit earlier in Tokyo, and it's not just the Bank of Japan governor who's been out, it's also the finance minister. I mean, this is jawboning mm. at, at an accelerated level because, of course, we're perilously close. We've been dancing around this 152 level in dollar-yen for three weeks now, Danny. Yeah, we're at a 34-year low, so that intervention risk is real and alive. But Steve Englander over at Standard Charter puts it thusly that they need to wait until CPI to intervene because either it's a softer number, that helps the yen, or if it's a stronger number, according to Englander, you just want to let the buying happen before you intervene, which would mean they intervene actually around 153. Well, do you want to hand over, you, are you, are, as the Japanese, are they prepared to have sconed and hand over all their, all their policy maneuver to, to the United well, States of like, America? How effective would intervention be with CPI looming, I guess is the question. Well, here's the point. I mean, they did interview, it, they did inter intervene in 2022, and that was in a reasonable size. The market's actually positioning for a push through, a push yes. through the 152 level. We've got an options trade. There's a lovely piece out this morning. What are the options market positioning for? They're positioning for, positioning for a further push towards 155, mm. and that that's where the biggest concentration of options are. But, you know, this, what was it, Ueda said, monetary policy isn't meant to control 
FX right. rates. Well, the good news about this huge short interest option built around the yen, which at the moment is also its highest since 2007, yeah. is that if they do intervene and it is successful slightly pushing up the yen stronger, you get this bout of short covering. So it could actually kind of work in the BOJ's favor. Well, of course, what we've heard from MUFG, which was MUFG, was who were this saying, the risk is that the Bank of Japan is seen as doing one rate rise and done, and that yep. that is what leaves dollar yen flapping in the wind, so to speak, and a lower level. So uh, let, let's see if they put their money, quite literally, where their <laughs> mouth is or whether they're forced into that. There's the crosses uh, for you, euro yen uh, fairly flat, but Aussie yen uh, also on the, move, on the move there. Speaking about money, can we talk about this Ivy League story that it's now going to cost more than 90000 a year? Losing. If you're going to an Ivy League, so if you send your kid there for four years, that's more than $350,000. Now, look, not every Ivy League school uh, are you going to pay the full fees. For example, at Penn, uh, there's a $21 billion endowment at Penn. And families who make $75,000 or less, of course, you get some assistance. Mm. And then, of course, you've got to look at some of these endowments. They're perhaps not under pressure, but Harvard's certainly seen a bit of a shakedown uh, after the disruption that we saw over the protests on campus, but $90,000, you'd want to make some pretty connected friends for 90,000 bucks a year. <laughs> I was but gonna but say, people do. I was gonna say, I don't have kids, but this has me thinking, do I need to start a college fund now? <laughs> Just get the Amex side. I'll, I'll, give you, I'll give you a call. I'll tell you what, I can give you a spare button from the suit. <laughs> oh, no, thank you, thank you. Just what I needed. <laughs> okay, coming, coming up, uh, all contributions to Danny's, Danny's College Fund for the Kids, greatly accepted. Keith Lerner, uh, Chief, Strat Chief Market Strategist at Truist, joins us shortly. Welcome back to Bloomberg Brief. I'm Manish Kenny in New York. And I'm Danny Berger. Here's what you need to know. The 10 year yield eyes 4.5%. Markets settle on just two rate cuts for this year, though the former Fed official, James Bullard, sees three. Israel signals fresh optimism on ceasefire talks in Gaza, while Hamas claims there's been no progress. And commodity traders had another blockbuster year, raking in billions for 2023. Manus, that is the reason that literally commodities are the only sector in European stocks that are doing better this morning. That's where you want to be. And iron ore has turned it around after being battered and bruised. You're also seeing copper on the up, yes. oil on the up. Go commodities. Go gold, too. Gold, no sign of quitting. I know you're going to have that in a moment. So, Manus, <laughs> let me not front run you. Let me show you what these equity markets are doing. Ah, it's not a lot. Better than we were about 30 minutes ago. S&P futures, little change, slightly higher. NASDAQ up about one-tenth of one percent this morning. Um, we do have a new street high from Wells Fargo, 5,535. I had to think about that one because it's very precise. Saying that the way we think about valuations is now different. It's a very calm market, though. We have CPI later in the week. We also have ECB. So why would you really want to take much, much risk ahead of that? It also means that volatility is calming down ever so slightly after we finally saw a pickup in protection, in buying a put, something that has been really absent from this market for some time. Meanwhile, European equities, as I managed, mentioned, Manus, are really languishing this morning, down about a tenth of 1%. Again, it's all about commodities, the only place that you can be successful in this European market this morning. Yeah, not just there, but also here in the United States of America. You're looking at commodities, you're looking at oil and energy as well. Breaking news headlines coming. Uh, this is a story that we've just broken, is that sources familiar with the Bank of Japan believe that we're going to see adjustments in the inflation. These strong wage deals that we've seen come through may well push the Bank of Japan to have to review some of their inflation targets, likely to set 2026 at around 2%. Uh, they're considering revising the 2024 CPI forecasts as well. So just keep that in mind. We're on tender hooks to see whether there is any intervention to come, physical intervention in these markets as well. At 151.80 is where you are. At 10 year yields, 438. Again, the momentum in this bond market, it's almost breathlessly trying to get to 4.5%. Will a hot CPI, where we are one step away, it's almost like one breath away from 4.5% on a hotter CPI print. Uh, Brent manages to raise itself uh, by three tenths of 1%. Again, what you're seeing here in the oil market is a real concern. Yesterday it was about geopolitics perhaps de-escalating, but there is a fundamental belief that this oil market constricts into the second half of the year. Danny, so of course it is coming down to what the St. Louis Fed President James Bullard spoke yesterday. Of course, we're reflecting on his comments, uh, he's no longer at the Fed, but they are quite prescient. He said it would be justifiable to start the cutting process.
Some people are saying that the next report will lead to core PC being only 2.6% on a 12-month basis. So you're starting to get close enough. I think you have enough data in hand right now to justify the first rate cut, uh, maybe not a whole string of rate cuts, but you could certainly justify the first rate cut now based on the data that they have. James Bodo there, our next guest writes this. Until the weight of the evidence shifts, our view is bull market rules apply. That is, investors should stick with the primary market uptrend and look to pullbacks as opportunities. It is Keith Lerner, Chief Market Strategist at Co-CIO over at Truist. Good to have you with us this morning. So there's Bullard, uh, keen uh, suggesting that the, the Fed should get on with it and, and do three rate cuts. You're in full bull mode. Where do you want to take advantage of the drawdowns if and when they come? Good morning. Yeah, well, great to be with you uh, post uh, the eclipse, right? <laughs> Um, and, but I, I think that's right. Uh, you know, I, I think we have to give the, the 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 benefit of the doubt to the primary trend, which is up. We also have to remember that we were, we were up five straight months. We had a 10% first quarter. Historically, when you see that type of momentum, when you look at six to 12 months, the, the probability of being high is very positive. But they don't come without pullbacks, right? There's only been three years since uh, 1980 where we haven't seen at least a 5% pullback. So, listen, I think the main thing, stick with the primary trend. And to your question, you know, as we get pullbacks, where would we look? Well, um, you know, we like financials, we like industrials. Um, we also still think, even though tech has been pulling back here and consolidating, we think tech leadership likely remains. And part of the reason why we think that is the earning trends for tech still remain stronger than the overall market. And that tends to go hand in hand with the overall um, tech outperformance. But again, that's also consolidating after really big gains that we saw um, over the last year. Oh, Keith, you've set this up perfectly of what I wanted to ask you about. It's I, I, I've been a little bit obsessed about it this morning, I'll be honest. It's Chris Harvey's new street high over at Wells Fargo for a year-end target. Just because it's such a weird number, it's 5,535. He had to outdo the people who had 5,500. <laughs> I mean, it's just so funny. 35 points more than SockGen to make sure he got that street high. But this is his justification, Keith. He says that in our view, the bull market, AI, secular growth story, and index concentration have shifted investors' attention away from traditional valuation measures and towards longer-term growth in discounting metrics. He's essentially saying, Keith, that the normal valuation metrics don't matter to investors anymore, and therefore, we're going to get a new high on this S&P 500. What do you make of that? Well, so I'm, I'm hesitant to say valuations don't matter, but I will say when you compare today's valuations versus history, it's not apples to apples. So let me give you an example. The technology sector that we're, we're all talking about in AI, back in 1990, that sector represented about 5 to 6% of the S&P versus about 30% today. And it's actually higher than that because the, the S&P keeps you know, uh, changing the index composition. So those companies also have uh, higher profit margins and also typically have a higher valuation metric as well. So I agree that, that you know, saying that, hey, we're at a 16 or a 17 multiple or 20 multiple and saying this is expensive or, or cheap is hard. The other thing I'll, I'll say in our work, when you look at the starting PE and you try to project one year returns, if you do like a scatter plot, right, it's all over the place, meaning there's the correlations are relatively low. Valuations tend to matter a lot more when you look at from today's starting price, looking at five or 10 years later. And that's part of the reason when we look at like, so let's say the next 10 years in our like long-term capital market assumptions, you know, we're expecting somewhat lower returns than the long-term. But in the short term, it, it's really about sentiment, it's about earnings momentum, and it's about price momentum as well. Um, so. Yeah, that's the way I, um, you know, I think about valuations. I mean, we have had a considerable momentum drive o over the past month, and that has brought with it breadth. I and you, you focus on this in terms of what's happening. Eleven sectors have risen by more than 5%. We've seen those in energy, we've seen those in financials, and this is the reach for breadth. We're counting down to City uh, and a number of the big banks on Friday. Um, does that breadth continue? Uh, and will those sectors, energy and financials, still hold on to those top spots? as we endure? Yeah, I think the, uh, the more cyclical areas of the market will continue to do well. And part of that is just that, you know, we're seeing, if you look globally, so, you know, gold, energy, financials, industrials, the 10-year Treasury moving up. The 10-year Treasury is moving up because GDP forecasts are moving up. Yeah. You gotta, we have to remember, you know, coming into this year, U.S. forecasts or the consensus was around 1%. We've doubled that. And we're only in April already as well. So I, I still think that 
overall cyclical trade still has legs as long as the economy continues to move forward, and I, and I think it will. But the economy moving forward has also meant that we've dramatically priced out the cuts that are in this market. We went from 158 for at the start of the year to now just 60 cuts being priced in, 60 basis points of cuts. And Berenberg's uh, Jonathan Stubbs would say of that, it means that the rates market is moved and the stock market hasn't moved with it. And that is a reason not to chase the stock market rally. To you, does that present a threat, the fact that we've seen yields hit year-to-date highs and stocks have barely budged? Well, I think you have to say, why have yields moved higher? And again, if you look at it, it's GDP estimates are moving higher as well. The other thing what we look at as, as yields move higher, we want to say, what's happening in the credit markets? Are those becoming you know, wider? And at, at this point, you, know, you look at the credit markets, very well behaved around year-to-date lows. So I think that's actually a positive. One thing we've been, a model really for most of this year is that we would prefer you know, less rate cuts and a stronger economy to an economy that needs a lot more uh, rate cuts as well. So, uh, but to be fair, though, I mean, we've been thinking really since last year you know, about three rate cuts. We still think two or three is on the table, just like Bullard said earlier today. You know, what, what Bullard said in the past, was I think makes a lot of sense, is saying, hey, if you think neutral you know, is higher, even, you know, historically, people have thought neutral, the Fed has been around two and a half percent. Even if you think it's three or three and a half, we're still well above that, so we're still somewhat restrictive. So we still think there's some scope for them to cut rates. I think it will be problematic if they don't cut at all, if they kind of take that off the table. That so-called Fed put that people are you know, looking for as if the market weakens or the economy weakens, they'll step in. I think that would be the bigger concern. So I think maybe it caps the upside, maybe it creates some gut checks. But overall, if the economy stays somewhat strong and earn, and that translates into earnings moving forward, we think the, think the underlying trend still moves higher over the duration of the year. Again, with normal pullbacks, as I mentioned before. Well, we're counting down to CPI tomorrow, and you know it does feel as if anything be over and above consensus could cause a sort of a, a jerk in those yields to 4.5%, and maybe even a little bit above that. Do you believe that there are real buyers out there at 4.5%, that there will be no massive acceleration in yields to the upside, even if there is a small dislocation in the CPI tomorrow? Uh, no, I, listen, I think there could be an overshoot, I mean, in either direction, especially when there's so much focus. It's almost like the CPI report is the new employment report. And if you think about the employment report, Regardless of what the number is, there's a knee-jerk reaction. There tends to be an overshoot, and then the market moves on. So, listen, I think there's definitely set up for an overshoot. You could see some type of, like I said, gut check uh, in the overall yep. market. But I would be saying, like, even with that, I mean, on the S&P, you know, around 5,000, that's pretty good support. So, again, I mean, I would be looking to lean into pullbacks as opposed mm. to be selling into them at this point. Hey, Keith, before we let you go, how did, how did the eclipse look in Atlanta? You know, I was uh, I was inside, out? so I totally missed the eclipse uh, as a whole, and I was making sure I wasn't looking at you know from my my window looking up. So I, I missed it. I got to wait to twenty forty four. I'm told now Keith, for the next one. Keith, you worked too hard, but you saved your eyes, so that's the good news. Keith, thank you so much for joining us. Keith Lerner of Truist. All right, man, it's coming up. We're going to talk about the blowout quarter for BP. It was a tough twenty twenty three, and now they expect strength to continue on. We're going to discuss that next. watching Bloomberg Brief with Danny Berger and Manus Cranny in New York. So Manus, BP ended the year on a high note with a fourth quarter profit that exceeded expectations. And at the same time, they see strong trading performance going forward. Let's get into it with Bloomberg's James Heron, who leads our coverage on European oil. So, uh, you know, a tough 2023 turns into a strong quarter. So what did BP's trading tell us about whether that can continue for the rest of 24? Um, it suggests that it will continue. Um, they had a pretty good performance trading gas in the in the final quarter of 2023. That's um, been maintained in the first quarter, according to the trading update this morning. And their performance in oil trading has improved um, from a somewhat weak performance in the fourth quarter. And that comes uh, alongside, we've seen in the last couple of days, really quite astonishing profits for the independent oil trading houses, such as VTOL, Trafigura, Mercuria, for 2023. And a, a lot of price volatility going on. So, yeah, it suggests that the, the strong trading earnings we've seen from the majors and the trading houses can continue. 
Well, it's certainly a, an astonishing uh, performance at Vito. This is the world's largest independent oil trader. $13 billion is what they made last year. So those huge earnings, do we know what the alpha was there? Can you imagine the bonus? <laughs> Can you imagine the bonuses that are going to be paid out there? That's a whole other story. Would love Talk that. to me about the numbers. <laughs> Um, yeah, the Vito CEO was speaking this week, and he really put it down to this huge realignment in commodity trade flows that's happened since the invasion of Ukraine. With, you know, Russian oil that used to go to Europe is now going to Asia. Oil that used to go um, to Asia is going to Europe. Um, and it's not just oil, too. It's metals, other commodities. And this is what these trading houses do, right? This is absolutely in their wheelhouse in terms of their expertise so it's not really surprising that they've seen that huge uptick in profits since 2022 because you know there's, there's rich pickings in the market for them um and and james manis and i were just discussing this note during the commercial break that uh bank of america has out on their Monster. price forecast i mean they see three thousand dollars for gold they see silver also big rally over the next 12 months they say the copper crisis is here aluminum's also going to rise i mean they are talking about this big bullish upswing for commodities so are the traders looking at that and thinking of the volatility to come and just licking their lips at the moment i think so yes and you know it's gold it's cocoa as well um yeah not just the the big uh, mainstream energy and metals commodities so uh, i think yeah volatility is is it's their business, really. So bullish volatility or bearish volatility, any big moves in prices, they are really well placed to um, profit from it. So I think, yeah, they, they, as you say, they really must be licking their lips. <laughs> <laughs> Who's not licking their lips and a little bit of volatility? <laughs> Options traders, anybody out there? It's what makes the daily bread. James, thank you very much. James Heron there. Uh, on the commodity, I mean, we've heard this super cycle called a couple of times. Mm. Uh, let's pivot to, div to Boeing, Danny. There's the stock uh, pre-market, pretty flat. Uh, Boeing and Airbus are both set to post their first quarter deliveries later today. And the analysts are anticipating to see cash woes from Boeing. Uh, more bad news. Benny Camel uh, tracks the stories. He is our global editorial lead on aviation. Benny, I mean, it's one thing after another for Boeing. Uh, more problems with airplanes this week. But in terms of deliveries, um, does Boeing lag Airbus? Are there operational issues at Boeing because of investigations? How is it going to play out in deliveries? So the numbers are out this afternoon around 4 p.m. local time here in Europe, 11 a.m. your time. And what people are really looking out for on, on the Boeing side is just how bad is it? I think everyone can agree that the numbers won't be good. The question is, will they be breathtakingly bad or will they just not be very good? Um, Boeing has been capped by the regulator in terms of what they can do. They have a limited number of planes they can produce at this point. This is because the regulator wants Boeing to really slow things down, to get that production back in order. And Boeing themselves have said, we are deliberately going slow. So you can expect a fairly low number on that front. And the picture is very different on the Airbus side. Uh, we had a story out last week that uh, cited people familiar saying that the numbers are actually fairly good in the first quarter for them. They're not totally out of the woods in terms of supply chain issues. That's still something that's rippling through the industry. But side by side, this is really a story of two diverging companies that historically have moved very much side by side. And, and as you're kind of laying out, Penny, we, we know what the problems are at Boeing. And it's been a picture of, of perhaps chaos is too strong of a word, but a shakeup. It's been two weeks, only two weeks, since Boeing announced the CEO's departure. They have new leadership, potential major acquisition, labor negotiations, tougher regulation. Can they convey any sort of stability at this moment in time in this earnings report in the call with investors? It's going to be very difficult for them at this point to sort of convey that, as you say, sense of stability. It's somewhat a rudderless company at the moment. Dave Calhoun, the CEO, yes, he's still nominally in place until the end of the year or until they found somebody new. But for all intents and purposes, he's, you know, a lame duck. You know, he's, the people will be looking out for whoever takes over from him. And at this point, uh, you know, the, the field is wide open. There's a number of names floating around out there. There are people like, uh, like Culp, who runs uh, GE. There are insiders, there are outsiders. Um, 
the one theme that's really emerged in terms of who should be next is whoever you speak to says this company needs to go back to basics. They need to go back to being able to produce planes, great planes, really what made the company great. And one of the legacies for Calhoun, rightly or wrongly, will be that he focused too much on the financial side of things. You know, the big number for him was the free cash flow. And it was, let's get to this 10 billion free cash flow now. Most people at Boeing probably won't get out of bed hoping that they'll manage that goal. So really the next person will be somebody who has to rally the troops and get people to, as I said, sort of refocus on the, on the engineering more than on the financial side. So a lot of things that that person needs to get right. And in part, that obsession with the cash flow, profitability and the bottom line uh, is part of the pay package that he was awarded a 45% at rise to $33 million. And again, another PR. That, that, that is the classic PR kind of nightmare, the remuneration being disclosed on, on the top of everything else. You talk about the profile. Um, is there anybody that sort of hits the top of that short list at the moment that's free, that's free to move to Boeing? I mean, there, are, you know, Larry Culp, as I said, who runs GE. Uh, Boeing has traditionally had a very close relationship with GE, and there are pros and cons uh, for him. You know, nobody's come out at this point and said, "I'd like the job," or "This is our obvious candidate." There's uh, Pat Shanahan, who used to be at Boeing, who now runs uh, Spirit, their big supplier. There's Stephanie Pope, who's an internal candidate, mm -hmm. who, until the blowout, was seen as the obvious choice. But again, she's somebody with a very financially minded background and maybe not the person they need right now so feel wide right open at this point um, they do want to move fairly swiftly on this I don't think it will take until the end of the year I think once they do have that person identified then Calhoun will move aside but we're talking okay. weeks maybe even months uh, certainly a brave person that that takes the man mantle Benny thank you so much Benedict Campbell there uh, from our aviation team Manis yeah let's just uh, reflect back on those commodity calls we have this Bank of America note you spotted it and, and, and it's certainly worth reflecting I mean they're updating copper and aluminium to rise to an average of twelve thousand dollars and three thousand two hundred and fifty dollars uh, by 2026 but it's the gold the gold and silver they're looking for three thousand dollars and we're already taking out records in these markets as it stands on a daily basis up 17 percent for gold since the middle of february yeah and look they say it's going to be pushed up by central banks china investors and increasingly western buyers on a confluence of macro factors yeah three thousand gold that's quite the round number Go commodities. That's, a, that's quite a distance. Another, another 700 bucks. Right, coming up, we're going to uh, talk about the rise and the fall of the Trump media stock. It's Bloomberg Brief, Danny Berger and Manus Cranny in New York. All right, let's get you set up for your trading day on this Tuesday. Here's what's ahead. We're going to have numbers for small business optimism at 6 a.m. Eastern. And then, as we we're just discussing, Boeing's going to report its fourth, fourth quarter deliveries, deliveries after all the drama at the company. That comes at 11 a.m. Eastern. And then the U.S. will sell three-year notes at 1 p.m. Eastern, Manus. We're also going to get 10-year and 30-year auctions later in the week, too. Yep, uh, certainly uh, one to chew on if those yields spike a little bit higher. Some stocks to watch. Coinbase uh, and MicroStrategy just both reacting uh, as we saw Bitcoin. Uh, trade over that $72,000 level comes back off that DJT, which is Donald Trump's uh, media company, spiraling from its debut down one and a quarter percent. Uh, just keep an eye on dollar yen and, of course, those bond markets as well. We may get a revision in some of the inflation numbers, Danny, in dollar yen. There is the little bit of a reaction function. Yeah, I mean, a little bit, but I mean, we did go from weakening to strength, so that's something. But Steve Englander says, wait for the CPI for any real intervention. All right, surveillance is going to pick it up from here. This is Bloomberg. Bloomberg.